All right, so this is using query May 18, 2020. Um, we are in the middle of Sprint J, is that right? Um, and I think we decided early on in the day to have this call focus on query cloud and the experience and um, some of the core flows that we promise to users and how those are going, namely sending data sets up to the cloud um, and pulling data sets down being kind of the two most important things that uh, <clears throat> we wanted to talk about today, but with any users who join, uh, but also internally as a team for some of the um, solutions and things that we're working on to make that a smoother process. Um, were we going to have Chris de demo something or look at some wires? Is that? Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've got some wireframes to look at, um, and then I've got a a sprint board um, or project, I guess a GitHub project board that breaks down some of the the things that we either want to do, uh, you know, now or would like to have, but probably can't do immediately. Um, so it's just going to go through that that list. Um, and we can also look at cloud as it is now and talk about it. Cool. And uh, Ashwin, since you've joined us, anything? burning on your mind that you want to make sure we address in the call since uh, I think you're, you might still be muted. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I filed a couple of tickets, but I was, I didn't know what the, uh, the topic of the call was. Just wanted to join to catch up. And Ashton, okay. I'll make a point of responding to all the tickets that you filed. Well, that's cool. I just point. did it. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Good. That's great to hear. I just wanted to make sure we weren't too far behind. All right, cool. Well, then let's have Chris uh, walk through some of those wires and B5. If those tickets are worth sharing with a broader audience, let's make sure we dedicate some time to talking about them. Sure. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll start off with just a, um, you know, quick tour of cloud um, so we can look at the status quo and uh, basically the, you know, you, you land on the, the landing page and you're greeted with the search box um, or search bar. Uh, then we have featured data sets, which we have a bunch of duplicates on. So that's that's actually a bug that needs to be fixed. Um, plus the sort of general inability for us to to add featured data sets. So this is reading out of a, a database um, you know database table that we have to like manually update right now, just because that's kind of how we left it. So we want to be able to quickly move and add things, um, you know, quickly remove and add things to the featured data sets list. Uh, and then scrolling down, we have this like recently published, which gives us one, two, three, four five, six, I think, yeah, just the top six. Um, so there's no, there's no like click here for more on the extended data or on the recently published. Um, so we've had, we have had days where, you know, things get published and then they, uh, they, they get pushed down too fast and we still want to go find them and can't remember what they were and that sort of thing. So pagination is a big one um, that applies to anywhere where we're listing data sets and you'll see a couple more views of that. Um, so that's like some stuff that probably need some work on the homepage. Um, and then if you click on a data set, let's do World Bank Population because that's a, a good Hello World data set for query. Um, so this is our data set view. And we've got, uh, I guess, most obvious up here is this overview components and history. These were like things we really wanted to build uh, with the first um, effort that went into cloud. And, and they just kind of got deprioritized uh, or, or weren't ready to be built yet. So they're just grayed out tabs. Um, so we definitely want to um, you know, revisit these. Uh, I think the intent was that the overview is kind of a summary and then components is a much more literal breakdown of the data set components. Um, but you know, I think the, the overview, you know, overview serves its purpose pretty well. It gives you like the, the title, which is actually part of the metadata. It has this clone button, which we had some debate over whether it should say clone or pull or download or what. Um, so right now, if you click it, it actually says, you know, it doesn't, doesn't actually download anything. It just gives you the data set reference and kind of points you in the right direction for um, pulling it down with desktop or with the, C, with the CLI. Um, so we want to work on that a little bit. And, you know, we've got a good meta area here that's got the theme, keywords, and description. We've got a 100-row body preview, um, which, you know, is kind of cut and dry. Um, and then uh, in addition to those views, we can click on the username and get a nice listing of that user's data sets. Uh, and again, same problem here is that there's no pagination on this. So it, it does have just a maximum. Um, and we want to make sure that you can actually explore a full list of data sets from a user. Um, there's also a search view. So if I just search for like data, for example, um, 
lots of matches for data, um, but this is showing 100, and I think that's the end of it. It just doesn't let us paginate. So I think there's probably a lot more results. So little things we want to fix, um, you know, little things we want to improve. So that's, a, I guess, a quick tour of, of cloud status quo. Um, so let me share again, and I will share the uh, sprint board. Whoops, share screen. Um, Let's do that. Did that work? I'm not sure what I'm sharing. You got your whole screen. No, I think we're seeing your desktop right now. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Let's try again. Share screen. Google Chrome. All right. Um, OK, so I've got a separate project board set up for cloud improvements. Uh, cleaned up a lot of the, the issues. Uh, there were some stale ones, uh, things that have already been fixed that were never closed, um, and then added a bunch of new ones. Um, but I basically got this chopped up into two category, two columns, uh, one being backlog and one being to do, um, which my, you know, my, my push would be uh, personally that the, the stuff in the to do column, you know, needs to happen in the next, you know, next sprint. Sprint or a couple of sprints uh, or whatever amount of time we're gonna be spending on the on cloud in the foreseeable future. Um, or in the immediate future, and then the, the other stuff could be deprioritized. Um, so I'll start with the to-do column, and we'll just run down the list. Uh, first one is continuous deployments, um, which is, I just know that it's, uh, it's still sort of difficult to public, or to deploy uh, small changes that we make. Um, we want to make sure that we can do that as quickly as possible and as seamlessly as possible, um, as soon as possible, uh, if we're doing bug fixes or small improvements. Um, Second is Boolean rendering, which is uh, sorry. The the this is all followed by bugs, so I, I just prioritize bugs to the top of the list, whether whether no matter how large or small they are. Um, so Boolean rendering just means like trues trues and falses are not actually being sh are showing up properly in cloud, um, which I think uh, a couple people have raised. Um, invalid cookie shows default error page. Um, I think we've seen this a couple times when uh, you're signed in and then you come back later, um, you end up uh, in a weird place where it just says uh oh. Um, but I think something's not happening right with inspi uh, expiring cookies or something like that. Um, error message on settings page when not signed in. I think that's actually, I think that's the same issue. I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, these are, these are both, um, both little errors that happen with cookies. Um, next one is footer is not sticky with short content. So if the content's not long enough, it just shows up weird. Um, users table does not contain Twitter field. Uh, this is just a, a, a thing to make sure that we have all the fields covered in the user table. Although, generally speaking, I think the user stuff is is less priority than uh, than data set stuff. A um, couple more bugs here are no signature check happening when you try to push um, and elastic search returns duplicate items. So yeah, we saw duplicates on the front page. Um, so those are the bugs, and then we have a few things. So homepage improvements is kind of uh, you know encompasses many things. Um, but I think in general, we want to see stronger links to, to the, the regular website or the you know, query IO website, um, stronger calls to action for downloading and checking out data sets. Um, things like count of total data sets um, should be in there. Um, next one is we need download stats on a per data set level, and that plays right into data set view improvements. So it's just we want to be able to say for each data set um, how many downloads it has. Um, so has it been downloaded you know, 50 times or 200 times? Data set, yeah, so data set view improvements, I've got a, a, a whole list of things, but I actually want to show a mock-up for that because I have it. Um, next is lists. Uh, so I think anywhere we see a list, which is search results. Um, I can walk through the rest of the list, Chris, if you want. Um, so yeah, the, the other bits that each sort of really wanted to cover were like, uh, Oh, these are actually the exciting bits, which is kind of fun that <laughs> we went through all the bugs first. Um, actually having some improvements to the data set view are, are really worth it. Uh, the pagination sorting is just kind of like a must. I think it's more of a bug than anything else. But uh, the way we want to implement that is just with continuous scrolling, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, at least on the home page. Uh, and then tag views is just like the capacity in, in query we have the setup to do. Uh, you can tag data sets according. You can have whatever you want. And so we should be able to use that as a smart tag, like a smart view that collects up is that's according to a specific tag. Um, and then Chris, you want to talk about issue queues? Sure. Um, on tag views, I think, um, yeah. So 
we say tag here, um, but the in, in queries meta um, schema or meta in queries meta component, we call them keywords. Um, so you know those those two things are pretty much interchangeable. But I think what we want here is if if the keyword is you know home improvement or urban planning, we want to be able to click on urban planning and just see a nice list as if we searched for urban planning. That's all it is. Um, Issue queues are, are basically exactly what you would expect on um, on uh, GitHub, and it's it's sort of uh, there should be a, a queue that anybody can chime in and ask questions, uh, report errors, things like that. Um, so this is this is probably the biggest issue that's on here in terms of effort to build because it's you know we, we need, need a whole backend for it. We need a way to persist all, all this stuff. We need to back it up properly. Uh, and then we need to design the front end um, for it. So I think that's you know probably a deeper issue, but um, that's a that's the first real big feature. The rest of them are all just kind of rearrangements of existing stuff or or design improvements. Um, and then uh, okay, moving on, um, more consistent markdown rendering. I think that's just the, the way the readmes show up. They're just not really they don't really look and they don't really feel like rendered markdown uh, ought to feel uh, from where we see it in other places. Um, so that's just some style improvements. Um, admin dashboard API basically means uh, we want a way to do those um, feature data sets in an easy way. But uh, I think I added a note here um, where I say, you know, in lieu of building out an actual user interface, uh, we could just build out the API uh, endpoint and just, you know, be able to throw some curls at it. And as long as that's well documented, I don't think we need to you know, spend as much time as it would take to build an actual like dashboard that people can log into. Um, so that's one way to approach it. Um, next is stars and likes, which again is another bigger lift because we'd have to come up with, you know, new ways to store all this stuff. Um, but I just think it would be good to, you know, if you're not willing to get involved and you just want to follow something um, or like it and then maybe get notifications when it's updated, um, that would be nice, but it's kind of at the bottom of the list because it's it's not I, I think not as important as issue queues. Um, if we're going to do something big, uh, I would hey, pick issue. Chris, or, can or you uh, yeah. can you unshare and reshare something? Your uh, your your oh. page is frozen. We oh, think sorry. either that you're just uh, you're not scrolling it. Oh yeah, no, it just fixed. It, oh, it just fixed. Okay, great. We got it. Thanks. Um, okay, and then last on the list is user profile improvements, which I think is probably lowest priority for the things that I would prioritize for the upcoming sprint. Um, it's just, uh, I, I guess um, I would say if, if you look at the user page, um, all it does is show you a list of the user's data sets, but I think there might be things uh, we could improve there, like showing the um, recent activity, like, you know, so-and-so updated the readme on this data set, so-and-so updated the body on this data set um, sort of thing. Um, and then also, like, if we have stars, then this would be a good place to show off, like, here are the top star, you know, top three stars, uh, top three most popular data sets by downloads or by stars or whatever. Um, so that's just more sort of social features slash bragging rights for people that are publishing. Um, so that's my to-do list. Um, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going through the backlog list, um, but I'd rather just show some of these mockups so maybe we can talk about them. Um, so let me do that real quick. And let's share again. And let's share sketch. All right. So um, first is the, I've got two mockups to show. Um, and the first is the data set view, because that's kind of the main event. Um, you come to Query Cloud to look at data sets and decide whether you want to get them. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, basically, we've got a nice, uh, you know, nice contrasting header up here that's got um, the you know the the reference for the data set uh, and then slightly larger is the title um, but you know you can copy and paste the reference if you want and the, the URL should reflect it as well um, it says published by and then a link to NYC Transit data which is the name of the publisher um, so that's featured prominently uh, and then over here in the right it's got download count and a star count um, and then this sort of dual button for getting data. This is really like the, the most prominent call to action on the page. Um, and you know, my, my suspicion is that pull would probably include uh, you know some a, a snippet of, of CLI code that you could copy and paste uh, and just paste it into your terminal. Um, and then download actually gives you some options. So this is an actual download. Um, you know that will just download off the web instead of saying you got to use query desktop or query CLI to get this data set. So we're giving people two options um, 
which I actually think is good because it reinforces that data set doesn't just mean data to us and you can actually get all of it. Um, and you'll also get you know, the, the commit message and all that other stuff. Uh, it's just all kind of packed in as files into a zip or you can say, just give me the body. Um, and then um, we've got four tabs here. So I've got preview tab, history tab, issues tab, and settings tab. Um, and this is mostly aligned with GitHub, but I think preview is where you, you get an overview of the data set. History is where you can see the history, which I have a mockup for and I'll show you. Um, issues would be the issue queue, which I don't have a mockup for yet, but I think we can imagine what that would look like. Uh, and then settings would be where you can actually like unpublish um, and delete the data set or something like that. Um, so moving down this page, um, in this sort of header area, we've got important information before we actually get to the, 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 the contents. Um, this is sort of summary information for the data set. Um, so I, I like to, I've, I've been calling this sort of uh, privileged metadata or special metadata or something like that. Um, but basically the description, uh, this is the description from Meta, um, but I think it belongs further up on the page because it's more important than just presenting it as, as Meta altogether. Um, also this little sort of, this bar of information that's got the, the size, the row count, um, this is all just sort of important like leading up information. Before you, before you throw me into the readme, you know, just tell me, give me the lay of the land. Um, you know, I want to know if this thing has got one commit on it or it's got 600 commits. Um, what's behind here? I forget. Oh yeah, CSV format. Let me move that back. So yeah, it says CSV format behind there. Um, I also have this next row, which has got you know the, the, the commit message of the latest commit. Um, it tells us the hash of the latest commit and when it was committed. Um, and then it's also if it's head. You know, I put this little like head thing. I don't know if we have to do that, but um, basically, if you're looking at a, a preview for a historic commit, it's going to look exactly the same. So maybe calling out that you're on head somewhere uh, in a low key way is useful to people who are going to use the UI a lot. Um, and then the rest of the page is all these little collapsible um, content areas. So I, my, my, um, my idea here is that basically readme and body preview are most important and should be showing by default. Uh, and I think metadata and structure are less so and should be closed by default. Um, but we can also rearrange them or we could also show them all by default. But um, this is my sort of first opinion uh, of just, you know, give me the readme. Um, let me scroll down and take a look at the, the shape of the data and what kinds of stuff is in it. And then if I really want to go deeper and see column descriptions, um, I can expand structure. And metadata, I think, would just literally be a table of all the metadata. Uh, we could even reuse the component from desktop. Um, so that's, uh, and then we get, and then this is the same footer that's on query.io, so it's a little more consistent. Um, but uh, I think that should be pretty straightforward. And then last, before we can start some discussion, is this uh, history view. So uh, imagine the user just click this little history tab. Uh, the header remains completely the same, um, but this shows the history and uh, should look familiar. We just got the commit message and, and some info about who committed it and when, um, you know, with the assumption that we, at some point in the future, we'll be able to have multiple people uh, collaborating on the same, uh, same data set, which would be great. Uh, and then we copy a little bit of that uh, you know, top level structure data um, so that we just have the lay of the land. I can kind of quickly see over time that this thing started out as 51,000, now it's 58,000. Um, I can see that that happened, you know, that was over the course of six months over a few different commits. And then uh, basically click on this little eyeball and you, you'll get back to, back to this view um, for that point in time. So you can actually see like what happened um, on that on that, uh, or what, what the data set looked like during that, uh, during that commit. Um, last but not least is these grayed out guys, because I think there's this idea of, uh, you know, there, there may be uh, data sets that are, that cloud is aware of existing, but they aren't actually published to cloud, which means other users may not be able to pull them down, but it's still important that they are annotated in the history and maybe they do exist somewhere else and are just backed up. Um, backed up locally or just were never published for whatever reason. Um, so we need to, some way to capture that. So, okay, that's my spiel. Um, so you see we've got kind of a good list of, of prioritized features and then a couple mockups to start working from. Uh, I plan to also build mockups for like pagination uh, and the kinds of sorting, sorting and pagination that people would want to expect. Um, and uh, what else? Um, 
yeah, I'll probably start with that as the next one. But these are the these are the first two. So, what do we think? So great. Um, I, on this view, the history view, um, I wonder if we can and should expect um, users to want to see the issues or conversations that exist from version to version as either another collapsed section, like. Uh, I don't have the pen, but like underneath rerun transform, there might be a down arrow of any issues if there are. And when you open that, it shows me how many people have commented or something. Um, I don't know. I don't know how wise it is. Like, obviously, there's a <laughs> jamming all of this on. It's a delicate balance between trying to always jam everything on one page versus have clean pages for each purpose. Um, but my first instinct was like, cool, why did you have to, re you know, I rearranged the meta tags because someone commented, hey, these meta tags are not arranged properly or something. Sure, I, I think, um, I don't know, I think in my mind that the issues kind of ride at the data set level, so they're not necessarily tied to a specific version, although we know when versions happen and we know when comments happen. So I wouldn't say it's out of the question to like assume that comments are, you know, somehow connected to a, a specific version. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, an, that's an awesome idea. Rusty. I think when you come back to, um, you know, you click on a hash over here in history and you come back to preview and I sort of think, you know, GitHub isn't where to look for this because they sort of fall down on it. But I think anytime you travel back in time, it's not canonical in the current version, there should be clear an indication in the UX that, hey, it's history, you know, looking at you're looking at the current um the current version and some kind of really strong flag that you know you're in the past somewhere when you're back on the preview of a, of a historical version something like that i got no idea but uh, i'm just saying Get, GitHub does do it, and it would be nice if it did, and it, you know, query can. I think I think that's actually um, when I was building when I was you know making this little guy right here. I was like, this you know should be head if head if head should be boring and gray, and anything other than head should be like. You should know that this is not the latest. Yeah, so. that's, I'm just pointing it out. No, yeah, no, no real commentary on how. Just make it clear it's not. Sure. D five. Yeah, I think I'm really excited about it. I, Rusty pointed out right out the gates that like just the high contrast header is really fun. I think um, like high level this addresses a bunch of things and reinforces a bunch of things that I think are um, really exciting to see. Like just getting this download button front and center and having it be simple. Um, I think this is a step in the right direction. I think there's a lot of conversation about, how, about like how that works. And I, my guess is we're gonna be tweaking it forever, but no change will, in my mind, will be bigger than moving to just being able to download directly off the website without any um, like external app requirements. Um, question about whether or not we'll need to sign in for that. I don't know how others feel. Currently GitHub doesn't require you to have one. Um, there's a couple of other examples I can find, but. It's really interesting. I love the history view. I think that it's really nice to have the history view like really support what we're showing in Query Desktop and, and have this like railroad along the side showing the, the history of a data set. Um, to me, like generally, I think that this looks a lot like desktop and, and feels like we can really pull the two together uh, in a way that just the simple gesture of having this like dark blue header across the top instead of the side is like such a simple way of saying website versus desktop and and I think it means that a lot of the sort of visual language really uh, can be translated like effectively but I do like that in this view of it uh, the history view is sort of blown out it's taken as sort of the full size of the page so that we have a little more room to breathe um, yeah but it's but again keeping that like line that railroad track like dots in line thing I think is a really important uh, visual metaphor that we've really been building upon um, yeah, super into it. I think that just if all we did was surface like the preview uh, history, the download button, and a lot, of, a couple of other folks have been asking us, as you pointed to, um, the capacity to just remove a data set from cloud without any 
like we've had people on Twitter ask us like, hey, how do we get rid of, how do I get rid of a data set on cloud? Like being able to just do it from the web UI without having to use our CLI tools would be really, really nice. Yeah. Um, this is a, these are like a, just a ton of really welcome changes in my mind that um, there's some like open questions like like where does our, uh, I'm assuming like your profile avatar would go in the top right type of thing. Um, yes, forgot about that. Totally, but I mean, that's all just like housekeeping. Um, I think there's a lot to debate here. Um, the, to me, the issues are the biggest like unresolved question that, that really needs, needs to be thought through. Uh, but, I, you know, like as a, as a first stab, it's nice to have them here and just like have them present in the mockups and as a thing that must be discussed. I really agree with your prioritization of having, like solving issues first. Um, and to that end, uh, in the, the mockup has this download 5.3K in the star 236 in the top right. Like I think just if we could surface those download stats as part of the sprint and just get that number up quickly, that fills that part of the UI and at least gives someone like a, a metric for understanding like what how popular a data set is in terms of uses. Um, and that would, I think would alleviate the need to ship some sort of starring mechanism right at the gates. Um, totally agree that we could just focus on a very skeletal issue like you know even if all it is is like title text box <laughs> and like you have to be signed in to do this that'd be tough to pull not tough to pull off it would, it's definitely work to pull off but like being able to do that would dramatically change the collaborative capacity of of query and having an author who can close that would be you sort of see the, the like outline of what it needs to be anyways i don't know anybody else have thoughts that was, I think this is great. Uh, really Rusty excited. posted a comment in the chat. Rusty, do you want to just restate it so I don't have to misinterpret it? Or uh, that's another way I was thinking that you get an indicate that that you were traveling back in time. So you've got if you click on a hash in the history, it'll bring you back to preview, and the railroad track will be, be there in the margin with the dot on whatever history you are, but in there so you just mm. have the track and you're you know if you click on rerun transform the th third one would be red or whatever and that will help indicate that you're back in history normally you wouldn't have the track at all if you weren't back in history it looks like that got jazz hands from b5 and chris wong just for for keeping score at home two very formal votes of support well, I, jazz have all, I don't know if i had everybody's faces <laughs> present on my screen Something like that, Rusty. Right. So if you're on the third, you know, the third iteration back, the third one would be red because that's the one you're on. You know, so if you're three back in history, you know, there would be no tax, but that would be yeah, something like that. Mm. Yep. Anyway, yeah, I, we, we get it. Um, I, anyway, I'll, I'll stop live uh, sketching. <laughs> but I think that's a great idea. I think live sketching is awesome. Yeah, can we talk about the, the requiring a download, requiring a sign in to download? I'd love to know how others feel about that. Uh, I got something. I, I, I asked about filing an issue on it, and I haven't. But since we're mocking it up, I should. Um, if you look at I can I can find yeah, I can find historical backstory on it for um, for GitHub. Uh, I think it was Homebrew that caused the problems, but you used to be able to pull any file off of GitHub without a login, and now I think there's some kind of random hash in there because Homebrew was running their entire system off of GitHub, and you know it was pulling too many files and bogging it down. I. It depends on whether you put limits on the data sets, but if you don't require a login, I, I hesitate to say you should re require a login, but if you don't require a login, if there's no browser UI, there's no way to tell people that you're cutting them off. And so if you have somebody downloading a, a 200 megabyte data set, you know, once an hour to check for updates and they're not doing respectful like check that or anything and reverse they put it out as a script. And the only way to cut it off, there's no UI. I mean, you give them a 404 or another forward code or something to say that, you know, you can't have it anymore. And they don't see it. 
and the script the script they're running to report it to them, it looks like queries fall. Um, and so that basically means that basically cuts you off from putting it in in a public Jupyter notebook or any other neat use like that. But if you're gonna allow downloads without an account, you need a plan for cutting them off without a UI, without a browser UI. And uh, I'll I'll write that up as an issue on uh, RFCs. But uh, yeah. I, I think we need an account unless we make real restrictions on which ones you could download with them. Well, I, I mean, the minimum we should be doing is have the web page generate like a nonce and then the file doesn't get sent to the browser if the nonce isn't there as well. Like there's ways to prevent hot linking, hot linking that we should do kind of orthogonally to whether or not um, we require an account for getting the body. Uh, I think that's like pretty doable. I mean, people can defeat that, but like, you know, but to handle the common case of like someone just linking to a body and then having a script that keeps retrieving it, like there's ways to stop that from happening. Or we put, you know, yeah, have something in the HTML that that is required to be in the uh, the file request. It's so fancy. I've seen that in the past while trying to do exactly this to other people, and I'm now delighted to know why that was so hard. Um, but as for the question itself, like, um. You know, assuming someone is going through a non-automated route of just, you know, going to the web page, clicking things, uh, we could also do something like it sets a cookie, uh, and the person needs, like, the person can download like five bodies or something before we start sending a, a message like, hey, you know, make an account so we can at least know uh, why you like us so much, uh, etc. Yeah, I felt. Um... I guess I'd say I fall into the camp of this require a download. It's easier to it's easier to turn that off in the future than it is to not require it and then turn it on and then maybe have a lot of people who are, you know, expecting uh, or or maybe have it hooked up to things then have to to um, you know change the way they're operating. But um, also just in terms of where we are as a company, I think it, you know we should be. We want to we want to be able to to understand you know the the people who are coming here and and uh, you know how they how they want to interact with this um, and we also want to be able to nudge them towards uh, I mean so like we said there's there, there's a there's a there's a just give me the latest data set as a CSV and I don't care about anything else user um, and I think we want to we we hopefully want to nudge that user to become the I you know I believe in the virtues of vir of version data and we'll actually start doing it on my own for things that I have control over and then, you know, asking others to get involved in it uh, because it's the right, you know, it's a, it's, there's a value add. Um, so we want to be able to nudge people that way. And I don't want to, I, I wouldn't want to say like, you know, you can just have it, but you know, like you should, you should come back and play with the rest of the stuff too. Uh, I see different thoughts. Oh, sorry. Um, Specifically about signups and logging in, I, I'm echoing everybody else's thoughts, and I, especially like Chris's salient point about we can always turn it off if we feel like it, but it's better to have the safety valve in place. Um, I yeah, I mean, I what we have right now is like a bunch of barriers to people being able to download, and while uh, I'm sure it'll be frustrating for people just trolling for for things to be stopped by having to download or log into something. It's a much better experience than we have and also I, I, I think better in the long run for us to to be requiring that. So I yeah. Feel okay about login. Do you mind if I take the stick for a second, Chris? And then Rusty and yeah, actually Rusty you first. Sorry. Right, okay. Um, the thing about the thing thing about requiring a login is that you can always step forward, but if you allow access without one, you can't step back without potentially pissing people off. And so, if we require, I mean, that's if if you can't decide, then it's best to go with more authorization. 
And even if you do require an account, do a real simple, um, and, and that's really low effort. People have account fatigue, but if all they have to do is sign up and never have to download Dust or, or whatever, that's still a huge gain. And then um, if you do require an account but still want easy access, you could do super simple off for, you know, that generated token, token good URL, that can go out of public book or whatever. If it takes too many hits, you rate limit it with, with a code and cut them off and they have to generate a new token. And You fine? Um, yeah, I guess the, the one other question I wanted to ask is like, um, uh, Chris, the, the other thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet was that you've done a great job of unifying the sort of preview overview view and the components view in a single page and having and leveraging collapsed, uh, we've been calling them segment views on a desktop of, of like basically just like a, it's like a file header type thing and then whatever you want content inside. Um, I think it's gorgeous. I think it's like a really nice way of getting around the confusion that we've had in a number of other places. And, and like that's, there's like a, been a lot of tension here uh, for those who haven't seen the other cracks we've taken at this problem. Like the idea of a summary of a data set and then having the full data set has almost always split into two pages for us. And we've had a lot of trouble figuring out how do we do the fast view and the long view. Um, Cause you kind of want both in the long run. You want to be able to dig all the way into every piece of metadata. And then you also want to be able to like, just get this really clean, cohesive, uh, high level view that is as short and concise as possible. Uh, short and concise are the same thing, which is a long way of saying as concise as possible. Um, the, and I think that the solution is really nice. Just leveraging the fact that you just leave stuff closed by default is really slick. Um, to that end, my question actually is more around execution. Um, We've, we've, had, we've batted back and forth a bunch about the idea of should we try to take some of desktop's code base and use it as front end UI. Um, so they, there's, two parts, there's two parts to this question. It's the technical implementation side, and then there's the, but the, and we can kind of leave that a bit to the side. And more importantly, it's the do we want this in the first place uh, conversation. Uh, desktop has like a segment view built into it. What do we think? Do we do we think that's reusable here? Like if we if, like we could just copy and paste literally just to keep the code bases separate. But we have had folks jump in the chat and ask if they can make contributions to cloud, sort of because they want to move it forward. And maybe just being able to contribute to the to the to a, a harmonized UI would make that effort faster and more straightforward without having to worry about the fact that the one reason that cloud is a closed code base is like it's running on cloud infrastructure that we run and there are a bunch of APIs in there that are private and those just kind of can't leave our own domain given the sort of like security questions around running the way that we run large cloud infrastructure. Um, so Chris, my question to you is like, do, how would you feel about like having this, the like cookie cutter exact same UI in, even if all that we did in the beginning was copy paste uh, components between two code bases and maintain them independently? Uh, and then part of that also falls uh, Casey to the head of, of the sort of like maintenance of some of this stuff. Um, how does that sort of sound? Because we've talked about this in the past. I'd just like to get that conversation out. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the I mean, the cloud, um, the cloud code base is, is an express app. So all these are, it, it is using React, but there, it's all server rendered React. So there's no, there's no front end React app happening. Um, so, you know, to, I mean, a lot of it doesn't, it depends on it just depends on how complex we want the thing to be and do we care about you know the page refresh when you're switching between these two things um i, I just the the flag for me on that is that like we can't have like full-on react components in one place and then have to design them all to be server rendered and static -y. um because right now it's 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 actually you know it's a bit hacky what's happening with cloud um to I wouldn't say it's hacky, but like basically some of these pages actually need front end JavaScript or client side JavaScript. And then we have to inject that, you know, depending on the route. And it's, it's just a, you know, it's probably easier than, than standing up a react app in cloud, but it's just one more thing you got to think about is that every, every individual view has its own separate like client side code. Um, so, you know, it's just, I, I think it's, I think it's going to be a trade off, but I actually lean more towards like, yes, there's enough repeated stuff on here like table views, like, to, you know, the little, 
all the little, all the icons everywhere, like the little like, you know, file type indicators or, or just column type indicators and like the pop ups and all that stuff is just like, those should just behave the same way everywhere. I should click on a header and see a little thing and then it will show me the description and some other stuff. Um, and of course there's gonna be more, you know, there's gonna be differences between desktop and cloud uh, in some of their functionality, but in terms of just like table stakes presentation of all the parts of a data set and then like even little things like the you know eight megabytes and the like we've already re reused these in several different places um showing the number of rows and all that sort of thing um and then not to mention all the css and fonts and all that stuff yeah so i i would lean that way but i know it'll be more work to react appify uh cloud front end uh Esmer has his hand raised unless that was by accident Ezra. Yeah, no, 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 it, it's good. Uh, so just wanted to chime in on um, cloud being same slash similar to, to the desktop app. Uh, personally, I think feel-wise, uh, it should be very similar. So a very natural progression from one to the other, especially like if you want to pull, you click the button and it pops up the desktop app and it kind of like flows nicely into, into each other UI-wise. However, I would actually very much like if it were completely separate things. Uh, one of the main reasons being uh, cloud is mostly to present a data set, find a data set, kind of like just interact with the general uh, data world. Uh, while the desktop app is a more uh, pepped up version of the CLI, which actually is, at least in my perspective, again, a tool chain for data and uh, like a whole universe of tools that you can do and apply to different data, to different pieces of data, make a commit, uh, I don't know, go back and forth, uh, apply transforms, run SQL queries and stuff like that, uh, which I'm not sure they should belong into the cloud interface itself, at least not right away. Yeah, to me that really resonates. I think the, the good like it can be really it can be really tempting to say like hey it would be wouldn't it be nice if it was all one thing but they, they they're really we have had a web app and a desktop app in the past and that even those two rendering techniques were like just the fact that the way electron handles links is completely different from like everything and we had to like special set up special webpack files for all that um I think there might be, and, and Chris, to your point that like, yeah, we just to clarify for others in the call, like we do server side rendering in uh, on Query Cloud specifically so that will show up in Google Data Set Search. Making your pages actually render real actual HTML means that it is scrapable by things that we want to scrape us, uh, including data set search stuff, um, which is, I think, a vital characteristic. And we worked really hard to get server side rendering working properly um, on the, the cloud side of things. Having cloud be a fully functioning, like, totally soup to nuts react app i don't think is like a wildly high priority um to me the but i'm wondering if there's maybe a, a universe where like like i'm thinking specifically about a whole bunch of components that are uh pretty nicely stuff contained none of them they like on the desktop side they don't touch the state tree they that might serve as like the basis for a, like a sort of a unified ui framework library like uh, we have like a, a data set item component or like a data set details component, which shows like the, the size and megabytes, the number of commits and um, the last uh, time it was last changed. And like that is reliant on a sort of data model that is structured, that is defined in TypeScript. I would love it if I had a package that was NPMified that had those data models defined, that had uh, some of those components and another package that had some of those basic components that are effectively stateless. Um, defined that would just be able to roll that in and then ideally that that makes the look of the two the same without involving any of the functionality of the two um, considering that server-side rendering is so maybe there's a basically what I'm suggesting is maybe there's a way to kind of not try and go for the like gauntlet of having everything be unified and instead only dupl duplicate work on the basis where we are quite literally copy pasting between two things um, yeah, Casey. Uh, so we'd sort of had a version of this conversation before, um, specifically surrounding the network tab on desktop and cloud, where 
it, it sort of became, it sort of became like a network should, should be your, uh, okay. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that anything that you can do in the query desktop app should be something you can do in cloud, but I think anything that you can do in cloud should be something you can do in the desktop app. And specific, and like the way that we can look at and explore a data set on the network in cloud should be the way that you look and explore a data set on the network tab in desktop. So having those two things be visually similar, I think like makes a ton of sense and helps us cut down on like duplication work. Um, I, I, I'm almost like this hat, like, I feel like that's just what has to happen. And then my question more is like, rather than if it should or shouldn't is like, what's the best way to get these things to merge now? Um, but yeah, that's, those are my thoughts. I, I mean, I feel like the network tab and desktop can literally be loading the pages from cloud with different CSS and you know, it's like, doesn't, they don't even need to concern desktop with that. Like all you're doing is clicking a button and then desktop takes over and does, does desktop -y, query networky things. Um, until then it's just a web browser. Uh, so just a thought, but like the, the, the data set view, um, and the, and the history view, you know, could literally just be the same, you know, look like they were in a web browser with a little bit of CSS, CSS hackery to override it and make it look more desktopy, maybe. Cool. Uh, we're at 248. B5, did you need to drop? I do. I'm very excited about this. Um, great stuff, Chris. Thank you so much for showing. And um, yeah, looking forward to getting a bunch of this shipped on cloud. I do want to make sure that if others have any stuff they want to chat about vis-a-vis uh, -vis query core, we should leave some time to talk about that as well. Uh, by core, I mean the the like uh, as when the issues you filed as well. But yeah, with that, I do have to run. Thank you so much. It's nice to see all of you, and uh, we have a call on Friday. Looking forward to anybody who joins. See ya. See ya. Uh, Ashwin, not to put you on the spot again, but um, yeah, anything you wanted to flesh out from your sort of experience um, and, the, and the issues you filed related to it? Yeah, I just uh, got more and more deep into, you know, using the tool a lot more, uh, making edits. Um, I was doing some web scraping, so uh, generating some, some data sets. So there were a couple of issues uh, that, that I filed on Query Desktop, like, uh, one thing is once I reach a certain point where I have a lot of uh, you know, commits, I can't edit the uh, can't edit the data set anymore because the status uh, tab gets locked. And I don't know if that's I, I, I filed the 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 issue ticket in, uh, in GitHub, uh, and then I also came across the Boolean uh, issue, but uh, one thing I wanted to raise was you know happy to again contribute. Uh, I know Asmir is working on the SQL stuff, so that's still on, on hold. As I said last time, I would be happy to contribute over there, but if any of these. Oh, you might have frozen. Ashwin, are you there? Bummer. Hey, Ashwin, you froze right as you were going into that third point about uh, the SQL stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, what I was saying was, I know Asmir is working on the SQL stuff, so that might be on hold. So any of these latest issues that have come up, I'd be happy to contribute uh, if they're good first issues. Yeah, that would be great. I think um, that repo is the, well, the query, we were talking about this internally a little bit. That's the one repo we have that's private. Um, and so mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we talk about um, why that is and how and whether we can have contributors contribute to that. I think there's some reasons we don't, but um, boy, I'd hate to turn a, an eager and capable contributor away. Um, so I think we'll have to just talk about that and circle back maybe, unless there's other folks on the call who know a little bit more than I do. No, I don't know. I think that's a Brendan decision. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, front end. I mean, the front end code is pretty, um, is 
is is married to the backend code in a single repo. And I think the we're more concerned about the the not being a public repo on the on the backend stuff. Um, but anyway, we'll figure it out. And we'll get back to you. Makes sense. Yeah, super exciting to have someone as eager as you are to help out though. Um, anything else? Both uh, Casey and Dustin and I made the same face at um, hearing about your first issue. Maybe it's like, hmm, sort of. Um, face. Exciting to hear an issue that is one that I, I don't know about. So <laughs> sometimes people file file issues or talk about things and I'm like, yes, that's something we're getting to. Or like, and that one I'm like, that's interesting. I wonder what that could be. Yeah, I mean, I can I can share my screen if you want. Yeah, to show yeah go for it. Okay. One sec. Okay, let me know when you see it. We are good. You see it? Yep. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so see when I open query, it comes in this history tab, right? In my local data set. Now I can't click on here because it's, it's locked out. Um, can't click on status unless, uh, and, and the reason I believe is I have too many um, commits mm -hmm. I've made, so I can't really scroll uh, and, and this thing is being locked out unless I like maximize the screen. Um, and then it sort of gives some room so to where I can scroll and then the status tab unlocks. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see what it is. The div is blocking the status tab because there's some weird flow happening that right. wasn't testing or didn't see about when you have a super long history. Yep. Yeah, totally. There's a okay, menu cool. item to show the status, right? Uh, to kind of like work around this. Uh, I forget what it is. Sorry, a menu item? Uh, yeah, hold on one sec. I'm trying it out. Like from the app, uh, is this on uh, Mac OS? Yeah. Yeah, uh, one second. Um, I'm trying this out myself. Uh, maybe not, maybe it's Windows only. Yeah, sorry, never mind. Oh, wait. Yeah, if, uh, in the uh, menu bar, data set, show status. Oh, that doesn't work. Doesn't work? It doesn't work. Bummer. It's there, but it doesn't work. That's unfortunate, yeah. Never mind. Cool. Well, that's a fun bug. Yeah, doesn't work for me either. All right. So it's on the heap of things to fix, I suppose. Yeah. Um, good thing this, this is the exact purpose of calls like this. I'm really glad that we had a chance to have you walk us through it, especially. I know Casey always, always asks for screenshots and videos and stuff for recreating bugs. That was helpful. Um, any other parting thoughts before we wrap here? All right, cool. Well, let's call it. Um, all right, everybody, thanks. And uh, yeah, building slash Sprint J demo is this Friday. So we'll see many of your faces then. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Thanks. Have a good night. Yeah.